All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another session uh, for the Bitcoin Academy. I'm glad that so many of you have registered and are watching this also live now. And um, we will make sure that you will get all of the recordings of all the three presentations uh, later this week. So you can uh, always watch that and we will make sure to also like send snippets and highlights from, from these conversations um, with our esteemed speakers also through social media. So today we have another fantastic session today with a slightly uh, different focus. And today we're talking with Alex Gladstein, who is the chief strategy officer at the Human Rights Foundation, which is a fantastic organization that operates around the world and helps bringing human rights abuses to the forefront and helping people fight for human rights. And uh, Alex is also a prolific writer and he writes about human rights and technology and has been published in the Atlantic, BBC, or appeared to BBC, CNN, Fast Company, The Guardian, The New York Times, and so many other outlets. And uh, the interesting thing about uh, Alex is also that he writes, oops, did Alex? Yes. I'm still here. Okay, okay you're still ahead. here. Yeah. <laughs> Just was worried for a second. Uh, that Alex also writes and is very prolific about uh, Bitcoin, especially within the last few years. So uh, welcome, Alex. Uh, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm wonderful. Thanks for having me, Wolf. Absolutely. And uh, we really appreciate what, what you're doing for human rights around the world, for liberty, and also, of course, for Bitcoin. Now, I would like to start with the fact that you are the chief strategy officer for a human rights organization, the Human Rights Foundation. Mm -hmm. So you work full time in human rights, but you spend a lot of your time focusing on Bitcoin and educating people about Bitcoin. How do you square those two things? Well, there's 24 hours in a day, so I can work nine to five for the Human Rights Foundation, and I can, uh, <laughs> at night, do a lot of research and writing and thinking about Bitcoin. Um, but I think that the two things are very aligned. Um, I once, like everybody else, thought Bitcoin was just this sort of niche, silly internet um, currency. Um, you know, that spawned a bunch of other digital currencies and that, that it just wasn't that interesting. That was kind of my mindset um, in 2015, 16. Um, we, we, we were getting some donations in Bitcoin, which was cool, but like, I didn't think that hard about it. And it was a, you know, a flat bearish market for many years there. So, you know, there wasn't a lot of interest from people in it at that time. It, it was, you know, kind of in ranging between 300 and six or seven hundred dollars and up going up and down a little bit but it, it, people basically thought it was sort of dead or or just a, a, a marginal curiosity um when it when it broke a thousand dollars at the end of 2016 early 2017 um i think people were like huh i guess this thing's not dead how did it survive and some people started looking into it more closely including me um and at that time, uh, several people in the Bitcoin community encouraged us to have conversations around the human rights aspect of it. I would later find out that the creator of Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto, was a human rights activist. Um, and this is very clear in all of their writings and intentions. Um, they were very concerned about two major kinds of human rights violations, the first one being surveillance and uh, the you know, kind of dwindling uh, status of privacy in an increasingly electronic world. And that, that was a theme from the cypherpunks who were these civil liberties activists in the 80s and 90s who saw this surveillance state starting to be built and, and chose to fight against it through open source code as opposed to lobbying governments to, to make better policy. Um, they fought the clipper chip, they fought for the right to use encrypted messaging. And Satoshi uh, had quite a bit of their legacy was built on, on that, that activity. Um, but Bitcoin isn't just a parallel financial system. Isn't, isn't, it isn't just a way to keep kind of governments and corporations kind of out of your financial business. Um, it isn't just a way to, to shrink the surveillance state. That's a part of it, but it's worth noting that Bitcoin wasn't launched after a surveillance scandal. It was actually launched during the great financial crisis or sort of towards the end of the great financial crisis. Um, and the other human rights area that Bitcoin um, addresses is, you know, essentially what I would call financial freedom um, or, you know, the ability to turn your time and effort 
into a, an asset, a money that, that can't be stolen or confiscated or, or remotely you know, taken from you or debased, which has been so common in human history. Um, so whether it be coin clipping of kings of past or you know, more recently, you know, uh, money printing simply uh, or loose monetary policy or quantitative easing or, you know, there are many different kinds of accommodationist uh, mon monetary theory and, and implementation. But at the end of the day, the point is that like bureau bureaucrats and decision makers, uh, you know, independently and undemocratically have been making decisions about the quality of money over the last uh, several hundred years, which result in like a, a poorer instrument for citizens, making it harder for them to be empowered and, and to build for the future and to save for the future. So I think you have both like privacy and financial freedom being the things that Satoshi was addressing from a human rights point of view. Um, this is vividly on display in countries where these two things are lacking, whether it be in the former case, China, where your financial transactions essentially dictate what you can do in society. And if you do anything against the government in any sort of way or slight them in any sort of way, or you're, you happen to be born in the wrong ethnicity or religion or whatever, um, then your financial, you know, capacities get shut down or turned off, right? Um, and this is something we see across the world in terms of, you know, surveillance and control in terms of deplatforming people who have opinions or actions that the government doesn't like. We're seeing that, you know, right now, obviously, with tech platforms wrestling with that. Um, so, you know, Bitcoin fixes that, you know, but but it but it also addresses and fixes this other issue, which is most vividly display on in Lebanon, for example, right now. Um, uh, not to mention 30, 30 to 40 other countries, but essentially super aggressive inflation of the currency. And the latest out of Lebanon is that basically if you have um, deposits at banks in Lebanon in, in hard, what we, what we would call hard foreign currencies, which really just means you know more valuable currencies, more stable currencies than the Lebanese pound, which is going to be devalued 93% this year, um, apparently. Meaning you're going to lose. You're only going to have seven percent of what you earn at the end of the year if you choose to keep your value in that currency. Um, so people are naturally flocking to like dollars, euros, um, other currencies, Bitcoin. Um, so unfortunately, if you have dollars in an account, what the government's going to do is it's going to take seventy-five percent of those dollars and turn them into pounds, and then it says it's going to pay you back in fifteen years. I mean, we've seen this movie before, um, you know. And if you actually look at it, currency debasement is such a critical part of history i mean of any sort of big event i mean there's you obviously germany i mean you read uh, obviously accounts of of you know famously weimar republic but also nazi germany had the fifth you know very interesting you know struggles with money and 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 you know that's worth reading there's a there's some great not uh you know history about that what is the role that money plays in all of these things that shape the world uh, i think you can look at any major event over the last hundred years and, and see how money is tied to it. I mean, World War I is, is you know, one of the most excessive and unnecessary uses of violence ever. And it was fueled by governments who went off the gold standard to, 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 to literally, I mean, that's why we have fiat money essentially is, is, is World War I um, in many ways, at least you know, when it comes to Europe. Um, and then you look at World War II and the outcome of that and the US being a strong power, being able to shape the rest of the financial system and getting the rest of the world to use dollars for their reserve currency instead of gold with the promise that we would pay, the, you know, <laughs> redeem dollars for gold at a certain rate. And then of course, Vietnam war makes it impossible for Nixon to keep that promise. He goes off the gold standard. Then we have the oil shock in the seventies. Um, we have the U.S. doing a deal with the Saudi government to, you know, get them to get OPEC, which held almost all the oil to, to price oil in dollars. And you have this ongoing Cold War between the Soviets and the Americans and the Soviets being in a position where they can't print money to buy oil, but, you know, they have to dig it out of the ground and the Americans can print it. So, you know, you look at what happened today with, with Iraq and Afghanistan. These are known as forever wars, but they're also known as the credit card wars. These are the first wars in history that have been paid for exclusively by borrowing. So there are no such thing as war bonds or war taxes anymore. Um, populations used to be much more democratically connected to war. They used to be much more invested in it and supportive of it. Actually, you can just go back and look at opinion polling throughout the years and centuries. And, and philosophers going back to Smith and Kant and so many others hundreds of years ago, knew, they, they, they knew this would happen. They could, they could talk about this idea of uh, belligerence versus monetary policy. 
And, you know, today the American public, uh, you know, I'm not going to speak for other countries, but at least in my country, just completely disconnected from the war effort. I mean, you know, we've got wars in a bunch of different countries. Just to give you an idea, in the, in the World War II era, um, there's a great story on the New York Fed uh, website about how employees of the New York Fed during World War II, they would buy these war bonds. Um, and then the government would actually tell them like what the war bonds bought them. And there would be accountability. Oh, we bought this plane and these missiles and whatever. I mean, could you just imagine that today? I mean, we're so far away from that. I mean, we don't even know what war we're funding. Forget like what piece of equipment. I mean, so, so you know, there's this theory. Um, there's a great book that I'd recommend people read um, called Taxing Wars, The American Way of War Finance and the Decline of Democracy um, by Sarah Kreps. And it, it really describes this... Um, tension between democracy and, and war finance in terms of there's this theory of democratic peace theory, essentially, that, that democracies don't really fight each other. Um, and that's kind of undermined by this, because that, that implied in that is that there's a corrective mechanism um, and that democracies have, have skin in the game when it comes to fighting wars, whereas autocracies or feudal systems don't. They can just send the, you know, the serfs off to fight. Well, if, if the people are no longer aware of the war and no longer connected and they're no longer getting taxed for it, remember Bush cut taxes during the Iraq wars, um, and you know, there's no like bond effort. If, if, if the war is being paid for by borrowing, whereby the people pay a cost, a hidden cost in terms of whether it be currency devaluation or negative externalities from asset inflation, um, or simply just interest payments in the future, if that, if that is deferred, then the war is hidden, right? So I think you can look at like every single major event in history over the last you know, 100 years, for example, 150 years, all of it relates to money. It's all so, so deeply intertwined. And Satoshi took a look at this and was like, all right, well, how can I make a currency that you know, bucks the trend, that essentially gives us a way out, that can fight this like really um, existential rise of the computer state, basically. And its intervention in our lives as we all go to digital and as we move away from cash. And at the same time, you know, can it also address this growing sickness in societies that comes from uh, governments being able to uh, engineer money without consent from the people? I mean, these are the two massive human rights struggles that Satoshi confronted. And the implications of this are just so vast. I mean, it's like impossible to even state, but the fact that uh, individuals now have access to a monetary network that's open and neutral and non-discriminatory and non-exclusionary that has the same standard for everybody in the world. You know, Jack Dorsey was being interviewed the other day, former CEO of Twitter, current CEO of Block, by Michael Saylor, the head of MicroStrategy. And, and I thought he said something quite insightful and pithy in that, you know, today, if you live in Nigeria, <laughs> you know, essentially monetary policy for you gets dictated by somebody in Washington. Or perhaps New York. And, you know, I've written about this, but, you know, 4% of the global population controls the money rules for everybody else. Is that fair? Like, uh, you know, I may have benefited from that system, but it's not, I don't think it's fair. So we have a world where um, it, it, we have haves and have nots. We have financial privilege. We have different kinds of monies around the world. Most of it is terrible and, and, and abused and used as a weapon against the people, not just in Lebanon, but Sudan, Venezuela, Zimbabwe, Iran, um, Ethiopia, Nigeria. I mean, so many, there's just, there's 1.6 or 7 billion people um, in the world today who live under double digit inflation. And these people finally have an option. And, you know, I think that that's, that's very, very powerful. So I've learned all these things through the activists. They've been telling me about money and why it matters. Um, and, you know, you talk to any activist from an authoritarian society and you, you start to ask them about money. They have amazing stories, but it's, it's never really been at the forefront of the human rights discourse. Like you go to a human rights event, there's not going to be a talk on currency or money. Yet you go up to the Turkish activists, you start asking them about money. It's like, whoa, wait a second here. We have like a big story to tell. And this is like very relevant for all the activist groups. Like they all like activists, just speaking more narrowly, always have trouble getting bank wires in, always have trouble with their bank account are always being monitored. Um, it's hard for them to do their operations. Governments make it hard. In some cases, in, like in Russia, governments make it illegal for you to receive money from abroad. So there's like all these like restrictions and Bitcoin just allows you to break free of that. And, and you're seeing that, right? You're seeing 
people realize that and you're seeing <laughs> activist groups use Bitcoin when the government shuts the financial system down, whether it be in Nigeria or Belarus or even in Canada or the United States. I mean, so so worldwide, you know, people have an option here and um, it's it's actually quite um, inspiring. It's like a soul. It's a soul. It's, you know, there's a quantum of solace here. There's a, <laughs> there's a little bit of hope, I think, for the future or a lot of hope, actually, um, that we could move in a different direction. So um, that's kind of you know my story and why why I think it's, it's so interesting. Yeah, that's very powerfully put, and and you really bridge this between like Bitcoin and human rights, and it's so crucial to think about like all the people that are get targeted by regimes. Most of us in this call and watching this will probably never have to deal with this, hopefully. But it it happens to thousands of people around the world, if not tens of thousands of people, and Bitcoin helps those folks to get finances and be able to continue the work that otherwise they could not do. But even more significantly, thinking about what you've said, the 1.6 to 1.7 billion people around the world that living under two-digit inflation, so 10% mm -hmm. or more. You mentioned Nigeria at 16% right now there. Like Brazil, Turkey, recently... Turkey, Turkey, 50%. Argentina, 50%. Like these are big countries. This isn't some, for a long time, financial media was like, oh, you know, Venezuela is like this one-off. Uh, first of all, like, that's hugely disrespectful to Venezuelans who used to be the, you know, envy of the rest of the continent and now are the largest refugee crisis in the world um, as a result, you know, in large part because of monetary, reckless monetary policy. Um, and no, it's not. Venezuela is 25, 26 million people. We got 1.7 billion um, living under these. That's that's more people than lack clean drinking water or that lack access to a toilet, like these big issues that the UN focuses on. Um, they don't have an inf anti-inflation program. <laughs> there's, there's, there's no alphabet soup organization that's going to come help you when you're dealing with this issue, because they're 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 complicit in it. They create it. I mean, you know, you think about um, some of these countries in West Africa that are some of the poorest nations in the world that are the legacy of the French colonial system. You think about places like Togo or Senegal uh, and and Burkina Faso. Th these places, um, you know, they still use the French franc. And in the 90s, not that long ago, <laughs> the, the, the French government, you know, made a decision with the dictators of these countries, you know, out of these 15 CFA countries, only one has ever shown any sign of democratization. They're basically all, all, all dictatorships kind of in service with the French still today. And they just decided to devalue um, <laughs> the franc 50%, 50%. I mean, that's just a decision that a bureaucrat made. I mean, we talk about how the Fed targets inflation rates by buying and selling securities today. No, no, no. This was just like a straight up decision, right? So that happens like more often than you think. And, and it's, it's terrible. I mean, it's terrible. I mean, what happens to the people? So you know, this is a way out. This is a way into a system where it might have flaws, like, you know, and there's plenty of flaws with Bitcoin, but it's the same flaws for everybody. Like it's, you know, there's no special standards here. This isn't going to be a world where like the Americans have it better than the folks in Togo. No, 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 no. We're all going to be on the same money. And I think that's beautiful. Yeah. And talking about like human rights, thinking about what it means, what people are losing and the people don't think about that. Like if you are living under a very high inflation regime, you cannot plan effectively for the future. You cannot plan for your children. You cannot pass on any kind of resources like a generation advance because it will be half the worth, maybe like next month, maybe in a year, maybe in two years. And so, so many things are being taken away from people that yes. um, Bitcoin allows no people there's a different option. That's the obvious part. I mean, we can all understand the plight of people in Turkey or Lebanon or Venezuela, I would hope. I mean, that, that, that seems clear and no, no Bitcoin critic has a solution for those people. I mean, we have people here in these countries using Bitcoin, using Tether, which is you know, a stable coin, which is a very interesting technology as well. Um, and and the, the, these technologies are coming to the rescue to people who, who are being left in the cold, literally freezing right now in Lebanon. I mean, I know people who've left Lebanon. I mean, these are people who lived through a civil war. These are tough, tough people, toughest in the world. They're leaving because there's no way to get heat. The economy's so broken. That there's, no, there's no heat. There's no heat in the cold, freezing winter. And then you have all these Syrians and refugee camps. It's a disaster. So, you know... There's no, U, there's no UN that's going to come in and help them. No, but like they have access to this open source technology that's borderless and permissionless. They can help them. And I think that's quite powerful. But it also relates to what's happening in our societies, whether it be in 
you know, let's say Europe or the United States, Wolf, like we've got monetary policy that's focused on, I would argue, keeping uh, in the American case, keeping interest rates low for borrowing purposes so that we can do stuff like fight wars. I mean, the externalities of that are so vast. It basically takes, it's, it's you know, we talk about how when, it, when, it, when a government it devalues the currency, it takes, takes the ability to save away, right? It forces people into riskier action, right? Um, same thing at the, in, in the United States. When the US government buys up all the treasuries, the, uh, it, that's considered like the um, savings asset on Wall Street, like Wall Street saves in long-term US debt. Um, and, and before 2008, like the, the US government wasn't like intervening in that bond market. Um, you know, it wasn't exploiting the global price of, of what everybody saved in. The, the, the premium financial collateral, the whole world is the US Treasury, the long-term US Treasury. So all of a sudden, 2008 happens. Um, they start buying trillions of dollars of long-dated, you know, Treasury bonds. Like the, they're literally manipulating that price. They're taking that stuff off the market, um, lowering yields. All of a sudden, the whole financial system's got to go higher out on the risk curve. So that's why you've seen crazy stuff happen in the last 15 years that that matters for people in, in our countries too. Like, for example, um, companies uh, making more money through stock buybacks and financial engineering than actual products. Like this is like, you know, company, fast food companies will make more money selling their debt than actually selling stuff. This is like the product of this like ZERP, like zero interest rate policy regime, which is madness. It's seriously, um, you look at the inequalities it's creating just in the United States, um, for example, the household, the wealth held, and, and I'm not, I don't want to make this a conversation about redistribution because it's not, but I just think it's worth noting that the, the current fiat system has perpetrated a, a huge injustice, in my opinion, um, by, by creating the cancel on effect where, where like, for example, today banks can, can save um, using something called the IOER, interest on excess reserves, way higher than average citizens. There's a, there's, a, there's a classist system. There's like the bankers and there's everybody else. They literally get to like just park their money somewhere and make more money than a citizen gets to park, put their money in a bank and make more money. So this has resulted in huge redistributionary effects. So for example, in the early 90s, uh, the, one, the 1% in America held 24% of the wealth. Today, they hold 33%. So you're talking about going from a quarter to a third. That's a huge, huge difference. And that, that is because of this policy that Greenspan started where, look, we're just going to lower interest rates. Um, so I think even in advanced countries, monetary policy is massively important. And you know, again, this gives us a different model where you know, maybe not so easy for our governments to fight all these hidden wars like that, that they can just kind of pay for by borrowing and you know, making our future kids pay for the, pay the cost. You know? Or, or force us to pay the cost through, you know, quiet currency devaluation and rising prices, you know? So I think that um, this extends to everybody, absolutely everybody. And you look, even in America and Europe, there's obviously, as we all know, tons of people who are less advantaged. I mean, you've got um, communities that are unbanked in America, millions of people unbanked in America. You've got people that are uh, it's just, there's like racist financial policy in America. Like, ba like banks will literally give like worse deals to uh, like African Americans than whites, things like that. Like the system is so broken. Um, and again, this just gives us an opportunity to build a new one and to opt out and to have like, again, like this alternative plan B, like, like we we're going to keep going in this fiat world. Cause that's, that's the world we're in. But like, we can all opt out into this other thing which connects us all and which is fair for everybody. And the incentives are such that like more and more people opt into that every single day around the world. And it's like amazing to watch. Like this thing went from being an idea with no monetary value at all, not that long ago. I mean, 2009, right? Then, you know, it became a niche thing on the internet. And all of a sudden it's like trillion dollar asset, corporate boards, nation states, like, we're moving here. We're moving. And there's no company. There's no CEO. There's no marketing department. People are opting into this thing voluntarily based on their own um, interest, by and large. I mean, we could talk about El Salvador, but you know, 
let's just put it this way. There's more Indian Bitcoin users in India than there are people in El Salvador. So like th 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 that is a, a small part of the global game here. Um, we're looking at probably somewhere around 200 million people who've interacted with Bitcoin in some way, shape or form. So, you know, maybe 2% of the world's population, something like that. You know, people like me believe we're going to get to 50% in the next decade and it's just going to change everything. So um, the cool part for me is the incentive structure. Like, again, this is a voluntary system. People opt in because they want to. There's no decree. You're not, and no one's forcing you to use Bitcoin or else you're going to get, um, you know, you're going to go to jail or whatever. That, that, that's a fiat money thing. I mean, if you, that's a, that's a, people need to understand the financial markets are hugely central planned, hugely centrally planned. There is no such thing as free trade in money. Um, <laughs> everything is, is held together by force. Um, there's, there's no reason why energy markets should be all priced in dollars. Like that, 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 that is an outcome of a political decision that was made. Um, and now the Europeans are paying the price. Just today, Christine Lagarde was asked by a reporter, you know, what, what are the inflationary effects of us having to pay for energy in dollars? Like, why does that make any sense? Like we're, we, 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 we have euros and we're buying from a country that doesn't use dollars. Why do we have to, pre you know, these are big questions. Um, but none of these, you know, think about it. Like the citizens of Nigeria, like unless there was violence, the, they wouldn't use the Naira. They'd be using other stuff. <laughs> so this whole system is not a free market system uh, at all. It's completely centrally planned. I don't think there's any such thing, you know, the, we have these conceptions of like the Washington consensus and like deregulation or free trade. It's all planned. I mean, that I don't, I don't buy it. And um, this is our chance at an actual system that is open and free. And I, I just think that's very inspiring. It is, but tell us more about that because I think you have done a fantastic job outlining all of the problems with the existing system and like how it hurts people in so many different ways and how it makes like democracy like completely intransparent and all kinds of other stuff so how does bitcoin fix us all of this well i mean that's something we say in the community it's kind of a, it's, it's it's sort of a a a, a, a motto uh, obviously it's not true in that sense in the grand sense but it, it it fixes a lot of things straight up like okay so um currency devaluation okay so now like now that you as a citizen without any identification or passport or paper or anything proving anything about yourself, just a smartphone or an internet connection, you can now trade in, um, let's say your local currency that you've earned in wages for something that's not gonna depreciate over time, that's massive. And you know we all know that Bitcoin is volatile, but I think we also need to recognize that it's going in a particular direction. Like I would not let the mainstream media get to you here. Like think bigger, zoom out, like Bitcoin is up 4X in 18 months and it's up 40X in five years. This is not something that was ever accessible to somebody in some place like Venezuela or even like inner city, inner city LA. Like to, to, in 2017 was not that, okay, five, five years ago, 2017, Bitcoin was like pretty already on the radar of a lot of people. Anybody could have gotten in at that time, okay? January 2017, February 2017, five years ago, we're up 40x. There, there's no instrument available for everybody in the world that ever could have done that. And I'm, you know, I'm always in these conversations with these like central bankers and whatever, the Inter-American Development Bank, and they're like, oh, it's so volatile. It's more volatile than the Argentine peso. Are you kidding me? <laughs> like, yes, the Argentine peso is, is going down all the way. And Bitcoin is volatile, but it's going like up and to the right. Like, you know, it's just amazing to me that these people don't see this. Um, so it's, it's, it's ability to fix currency devaluation is a big one. It's ability to fix things like sanctions or uh, capital controls. This is just obvious. Like two Bitcoin users are unstoppable. They can send and receive from any part of the world. There's nothing a government can do. No censorship. That's not how it works. There is no like, it's not like the US government can say, hey, Bitcoin CEO, stop Wolf from sending Alex a payment. Not how it works. A decentralized global competition handles payment settlement. And if one of those miners doesn't want to process the payment, somebody else will. So th there is no way to censor in the network. Um, it is uh, unstoppable from that point of view. So that's another thing that it fixes. I mean, I, I, I think there, there, there are many, many things it fixes. I mean, you can 
you think you talk about surveillance capitalism. I mean, with the Lightning Network, you can build an online economy where you can buy and sell things with digital cash, where the the the, the merchant doesn't know your address or your where you came from or what zip code you live in or what your last purchase was or all this crap that they know. Anytime you use a credit card now, it's like all your information is sold to the data markets. Well, in a lightning economy, they don't know anything about you. They just know you settled. They don't even know your name. So um, that, that brings us back to that world of brick and mortar retail, where you go and you buy a book or a newspaper and they don't need to know anything about you. And that was fine. You know, and, that, and I think we should fight for that. So, I mean, there's just a lot. I mean, I think forever wars are a problem and I think Bitcoin addresses that. I mean, I don't think it ends war, but I think that in the future, in a Bitcoin standard, it'll be a lot harder to do these like 20, 30 year wars that are just completely unknown by the population and just not of interest. Like, you know, even today, like, I mean, you talk about, um, I mean, we're, the US government is, 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 has this huge military base in the UAE and we're like protecting this like fairly grotesque dictatorship um, with very expensive weapons. I I'm not sure that that's something that most Americans would actually be in favor of when we have bigger needs over here. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, I mean, there'll always be conflict, but this idea of these vast wars that cost trillions um, th that are being paid for at the at the expense of the citizen, I, I just don't buy it. I mean, we've we've paid a trillion dollars. American taxpayers have paid a trillion dollars just on interest on the money borrowed to invade Iraq and Afghanistan so far. We're going to pay another trillion in the next decade, five to six trillion by 2050. That's all money that could could have been saved for the future, could have been invested in like productive things, in productive industrial capacity in the United States. God knows what else not to blow other people up halfway around the world in, in, a, in, a, in a situation that ended in nothing at all, no progress whatsoever, um, total disaster. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot. There's a lot that, that Bitcoin fixes in an immediate sense for individuals today around the world, you know, whether it be, again, connecting to family, being able to send money across a border. And there's big macro things that it fixes as well. Energy being another one. I mean, you look at what's happening right now. It's really amazing. There's like a um, big winter storm coming to Texas. So they need more energy. So what's happening is there's like a lot of uh, people who mine Bitcoin in Texas. So they're like giving their energy back to the grid to stabilize the grid. So there's like, like a futuristic mature energy grid will be using Bitcoin everywhere. And like, it'll have basically this like surplus energy use that that is mining Bitcoin. And then whenever the grid has a need, the Bitcoin miners turn off, they give the energy back to the rest of the grid. This is a futuristic demand response made possible, only possible with Bitcoin mining. So there's, there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff there. I mean, macro picture, so developing nations being able to monetize renewable energy resources, impossible essentially b before Bitcoin in many, in many instances. The, 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 the resource site where the energy farm would be built, whether it be hydro, solar, wind, geothermal, whatever, probably too far away from a population center to get any financing to make it work. Irrelevant now. Can be in a mountain, a jungle, the ocean, wherever. Just need an internet connection. Just need a Starlink. And boom, you can, you can monetize it as a government or as a community or as a business or as a population. You can turn that flowing water or that heat or that solar power, or that wind into the hardest money on earth. And you can finance stuff with it and you can, you can borrow against it. You're gonna see these countries, um, instead of borrowing from the IMF or the World Bank or one of these countries, rather one of these alphabet soup organizations that doesn't care about inflation and that inflicts it upon nations in some cases, you're gonna have alternatives. They're gonna be able to borrow against their provable renewable energy reserves and, finance Bitcoin mining infrastructure and, and create jobs and, and create energy independence. That's a big one. That's a big, big one. So there, there's, there's a lot here from the micro to the macro. Fascinating stuff. And the question from the audience actually lines up quite well with this. Um, Nika is asking, where do you see Bitcoin in 2030? You already made like some futuristic statements, how Bitcoin is helping already now and how can it be even budgeted up further? But like, what about like eight years from I now? Yeah, I mean, look, 
I think that um, like we use email because it's better than sending something in the mail. Like, like we don't argue about like the politics of created email or is it ideological or not? You know, I don't know. I guess we could argue that it's libertarian or that it's progressive or whatever. Like it, it doesn't matter. Like people use email because it's obviously better than using the mailing something in the mail. So that's kind of how I see it eventually happening with Bitcoin, that it starts to just get integrated into our lives and, and it becomes something that we, that many people don't think that hard about um, potentially. Um, by 2030, I mean, let's just put it this way. Adoption. Uh, we're currently at like percentage of world population, 97, 1997 for the internet. Had about the same percentage of the people in the world on the internet as people on Bitcoin today. So think about what happened from 97 to 2007. We went from dial up, eh, 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 you know, modem stuff to the iPhone. So yeah, the next decade is going to be huge. I mean, I think we're going to 2032, you're talking about, not only are you talking about three halvings, so you're talking about three um, essentially supply shocks to the Bitcoin monetary system, um, which historically have had a massive impact on the price um, versus things like dollars or, or other non-scarce goods. So you're probably talking like enormous adoption by economic actors worldwide, whether they be sovereigns, pension funds, municipalities, families, individuals, like you're, you're talking a lot more adoption of Bitcoin, at least as a savings asset. And I think you're talking like incredible leaps and bounds in terms of UX for, for using it as a, as a medium of exchange. I mean, just then like even in a year or two, it's remarkable to see the progress with stuff like the Lightning Network. And you know, we're going to get to the point where we have smart contracts on Bitcoin that can make Bitcoin do stuff that 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 you it can't do right now. Like it's going to Bitcoin's going to be able to, for example, if you want it to, I think you'll be able to like peg your Bitcoin to the US dollar if you wish. And then you, you don't need a stable coin. You could just you could just have Bitcoin stabilized as dollars and it can be sent to any other person in the world as a dollar instantly for free using the Lightning Network. Like this is the stuff that's going to really get very interesting for, for a lot of, a lot of reasons. Um, but by 2030, I mean, I'm guessing easily more than a billion users, uh, many more nations, you know, engaged but beyond that. It's hard to say. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, I don't want to make too many predictions, but I, I think Bitcoin will be a lot more valuable, not just in price, but just in terms of the what it, what it contributes to people around the world by then for sure. I mean, now, like, we'll look back at now as being like absurdly early. Let's just put it that way. Like today is like, it's not like 1990, okay, for the internet, that that's time has passed us, but it's like the mid nineties, the late night. And Amazon is, is, is a, um, a little company that Jeff Bezos is running out of his garage or whatever right now. That's, you know, that's where we are. So, um, you know, act accordingly. Uh, I like that. Um, that makes a lot of sense. So that's that's a, the the positive outlook on the future. But we have seen like many countries trying to to quote unquote ban Bitcoin, yes. and it's not very easy to do this. But tell us about like some of the worst case scenarios, but specifically also from a human rights angle. Any kind of dictatorship does not like Bitcoin, and we have seen like a lot of pushback against that, especially also in China, and they have been pretty successful at it. Um, of course, it's decentralized; they can never completely ban it. But what could be like a worst case scenario, especially? in countries that are more prone to like these very aggressive measures. Yeah, so we've got a couple of things here. Um, one is um, the fact that, and, and this has been studied before with the, with the internet, um, um, which I believe has, it'll be even more powerful with Bitcoin. But when you look at like a dictatorship like Cuba, they faced an issue with the internet. Um, they didn't want to adopt the internet because they knew that it would give people more power. But they had to for economic growth. They had to open up their country to the digital economy. So the Cuban dictatorship um, dragged, you know, not, not excitedly, <laughs> let's put it that way, brought internet in the island. And now, you know, you have it widespread on mobile phones and it leads to like massive protests and stuff. And like they, they didn't want that, but they had to, right? Bitcoin is a lot even, is much even stronger than that, in my opinion. Um, 
currently you see Mr. Putin having this dilemma. You keep seeing like different things coming out of Russia with regard to Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. So um, you see uh, conversations about a ban and then you see, oh, banks are going to issue it or, or allow people to, you know, custody it or whatever. That was like the latest thing. Uh, we're going to ban mining. We're going to take advantage of our, I mean, Putin talked about, he's correct. Like countries like Russia have huge resources that they could use for Bitcoin mining. So these dictatorial regimes are going to um, have these debates. Um, Bitcoin will be useful for them to get around the dollar system in an immediate sense um, or to take advantage of natural resources or whatever. But I mean, the more they adopt it, the more control they lose over the economy. I mean, the more people start using it, the weaker their currency gets. So it's a, it's a dilemma. I, I don't, there, there's no name for it yet, but I believe this dilemma will be studied in political science in a huge way in the coming years. So whatever it is, the dictator dilemma. Um, you have that, uh, which I believe in the long term is great for human rights because they'll eventually have to kind of open up to Bitcoin and then that takes one of their most powerful weapons away from them, control over the economy. Um, the other thing would be like, regimes trying to, uh, and this is the El Salvador thing, it's so important it's happening now because it allows us to see what could happen in the future, right? Um, as Jack Dorsey said the other day, he doesn't think what's happening in El Salvador is the way that Bitcoin adoption will happen around the world in a precise sense, but it will rhyme, you know, history rhymes. Like we're gonna see a riff on that elsewhere, right? So um, you have two things happening. You have some unambiguous good in as much as a country deciding to, to declare Bitcoin legal tender, which I believe should be the right for everybody in the world, um, in my opinion, open source, decentralized, neutral, non-discriminatory non -discriminatory currency should be legal tender everywhere. Um, that's a pipe dream, but like I, that's what I morally believe it should be, right? Um, so that's good. Uh, they could have done a China coin or God knows what else, uh, a CBDC, a civil liberties destroying CBDC or anything else. The fact that they did Bitcoin was very interesting and obviously very important, very good. Um, however, like building the state-run app was the problem, one of the main problems. I mean, the Chivo thing, which I think you could expect other countries to try and do, is not Bitcoin. Chivo is not Bitcoin. Chivo is a promise to pay dollars or Bitcoin. At best, it's, it's that. At worst, it's a surveillance control money printing machine. I mean, this is a government that doesn't have monetary discretionary monetary policy. It cannot print dollars, gets them from the Fed. Um, it's a dollarized country. Its banking system is very limited based on that. Um, but Chivo, I mean, man, he could, he could say tomorrow, we're going to pay all the public sector workers, workers in Chivo credits. I mean, not auditable. You have no idea how much is in there. As long as he can like whenever people redeem for dollars or Bitcoin, as long as he can <laughs> meet those demands, he could fractionally reserve the rest. You know, it's like, it, it, it's, it's crazy to think about. And then of course, like it's KYC. So he could have more of a micro understanding of a society's interactions where they're coming. Let's say you're coming from not having a bank account, just coming into Chivo. He's getting more control essentially over you. So worrisome for sure. I mean, is it significant that it's the first state run a financial app to connect to the open Bitcoin network? Yes, that's massive. And, and that's not like the US government would ever do that for us, like zero chance. Um, so that's worth, that deserves some credit. But I mean, there's massive downside risk here. Look, the good news is like, I mean, we can study it and learn from it and hopefully helps the Salvadoran people as much as we can. The good news is the Salvadoran people, you know, can use Bitcoin and they can fight back a little bit there. Um, which is which is good. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of positivity that comes out of there that's not related to the government, that's related to the people and to communities um, understanding how to use this thing. Um, but it's you know it's a, it's a, it's it's tricky. Certainly, and another tricky thing that that I've encountered because compared to the internet, when you were advocating in 1997 for the internet, um, people might have been skeptical, but that's fine. Nowadays, if you advocate for Bitcoin, people are skeptical but they also think you have nefarious motives because you're advocating for something which is technically like seen as an investment. Yeah. How, how do you approach that? Because it's a little bit more sensitive talking about Bitcoin than talking about like the invention of, the, of a fridge or like some other technology. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, this is only, this sensitivity is a byproduct of financial privilege. Like for example, um, 
reporters who who report on the financial system in the United States, they own stocks. They they own retirement plans. This is not disclosed in their writing. They own dollars. They use dollar instruments. This is also not disclosed in their writing. Um, it is not like they willingly go and use like the Bolivar or the Sudanese pound or something so that they can be neutral reporting on the American financial system. Of course not. Now they see Bitcoin and they're like, oh, ethics, ethics, ethics. You can't own Bitcoin and, and report on it at the same time or whatever, whatever kind of, this is nonsense. I mean, what if we think Bitcoin is just a better monetary system? Like, at a minimum, I think outlets would serve the public better by having, like they have one left and right wing columnist, you know, they try to get a broad range of opinions, which is reasonable. They should have one person covering the Bitcoin ecosystem who's paid in Bitcoin and one that's paid in fiat. And I, you, you'll see very different reporting. So I, I hope that they can do that. Um, but like, I, you know, you're correct. There will be accusations that, oh, you're just like, you know, pump, you know, you're, 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 you're shilling your bags or whatever. It's like, well, you're shilling your bags. You're shilling the dollar system. Do you want to like defend the dollar system? So I think it just is, is an opportunity. Every time that question gets asked or accusation gets levied, it's an opportunity for debate and discussion. Um, and it usually ends with the other person like retreating out of ignorance. Um, so if, if you know what you're doing, so um, I would welcome it. I would welcome it. That's an excellent answer to summarize. Like if somebody asked that, I said like, oh, this comes from a place of financial privilege. And then you can talk about all of the people that's suffering in different systems. Yeah, I mean, usually as a lifeboat. Yeah, usually the accuser is not going to want to listen to you and is going to want to shut the conversation down. That's that's another byproduct of financial privilege is financial arrogance. But um, just keep chipping away. Just keep chipping away. And as we can see, it's going faster than the internet right now. So uh, it seems to be working, even though um, people still levy. Every against, day. Yeah. It's just, to, just think about it. Every day, more people opt into Bitcoin. Every single day, it's 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 really amazing. For the economists here in the room, it's like the ultimate network good. Um, it's for instance, like Facebook or Instagram, all of that is a network good because the more people join, the value, the more valuable the network becomes. Now think about money, which is the ultimate network good. So it attracts more people, and the more people are in there, the more valuable yeah. it gets. And, and and you know, it's worth pointing out that like as that ultimate network good, um, and as the really this new money for the world, it will exist alongside all kinds of other technologies that are, if you're not careful, you would think they're similar or the same. So, I mean, I think Bitcoin users can expect a, a future of tons of different um, online currencies. I mean, you think of a world like Snow Crash uh, out of Neil Stevenson's mind, like Hong Kong bucks and whatever. I mean, people are always gonna mint money. There's always rent-seeking possibilities in creating money. Um, Satoshi didn't rent-seek, so provably, you know, was, didn't move the coins ever, um, assuming they are his or hers or whatever. But every other creator of of um, a non-government, both fiat currencies, of course, are rent, massively rent-seeking, and then every other cryptocurrency is a rent-seeking initiative. Um, the second largest currency, Ethereum, was. You know, hundred percent pre-allocated when it was created, and then since since then, um, you know that 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 has had a huge influence on who controls that project. Massive, um, and th now they're trying to move that project from proof of work, which is like a, which has an element of fairness to it, um, in terms of like you have to expend energy to to get the coins, um, to proof of stake which is a system that mirrors our own existing financial system in as much as the people who are richest or have the most, you know, are most influential, which is a, just such a disaster from my perspective. I don't understand this at all. It's going to be inequitable and destroys the very goal of what we're trying to do. It's, it's very, very interesting to me. But there, of course, as I mentioned, there's things like Tether, uh, essentially centralized digital assets that are outside of regulation. That's really what they are. Like, what are and what are NFTs? Art outside regulation. <laughs> like, what what are stable coins? Dollars outside of regulation. What is DeFi? Um, attempts to borrow and finance and things like that outside of regulation. So the, the question in the end is just for these projects. You know, how long do they evade regulation, or, or do regulators change their minds and allow them? This is what we're watching unfold. Um, but these things all have some element of. Um, counterparty risk, centralization to them that you need to study carefully. 
And, you know, I think that the, the, the Bitcoin will exist kind of alongside a literal sea of these different projects, like moving forward more than we have today, doing all kinds of different things. But at the end of the day, like, I believe it'll become the bedrock of, of all of all of this stuff. And I think from a financial point of view, what's interesting to think about is that our, since our money has been so bad, like it loses so much value every year, even the dollar, like losing several percent every year is a big deal when it comes to finance. Um, it has turned other things into money, meaning that store of value component. So because we can't use our money as a store of value, um, we've been using things like houses as a store of value. We've been using things like stocks, uh, negative yielding government debt, gold. So my theory, which is a common one in the community, is, is, is that essentially over the coming decades, like the value um, in terms of purchasing power, goods, services, whatever, of things like gold, real estate, government bonds, stocks will, will decline in proportion to Bitcoin's value. Like people are going to realize Bitcoin is a better store of value than those things because it's scarcer. It's instantly liquid 24 seven. You can move it. I mean, think about the work it takes to sell a house, you know, like, okay. So those things will all preserve value. Gold will have industrial value. Houses will have value. Stocks will have value. Bonds will have value. They just won't have the value they have today. So it'll be like reduced in proportion to Bitcoin's value, which will be very large in the future because of its features and attributes. So I think you can expect some change along there too. And I'm someone who believes the same with regard to all these other cryptocurrencies. They'll have value. They'll always have value. It's just some of them will, their value will de de decline in proportion to Bitcoins over, over time. Um, which is not an easily noticeable, an easily noticeable trend right now, um, because short term they obviously are more performant. Like if well, if you and I, this is how it works. You and I would make up a coin, and we would call an exchange and ask if they could list it for a certain price. Boom, and we just let's say we created five hundred billion of these tokens, and and they listed the token for like whatever a fraction of a penny. Boom, you and I now have two hundred million dollars. That's our market cap. This is money. This is how these tokens get created. So that is um, only possible in today's non-Bitcoin standard. Like that, that, that money creation possibility um, will be much reduced in the future. We'll still be able to create a currency and make our case to the market that it's valuable, 100%. I mean, we'll be able to try and sell equity in companies and do all kinds of things that we do today in that future. It's just <laughs> people will be less... Um, willing to take that risk because they're going to have a well-performing money that that preserves as a, that that is that is essentially an investment. Um, so this is going to have massive consequences for the the world at large. Absolutely, and you have already mapped out some of those with your prediction that maybe within the next uh, few years we will be at like a billion users, which will be like 800 million more people using this. Which brings up another question that Michael asks, which is about how do you see the evolution of scaling? Right now, I mean, there's the, the base layer, which is Bitcoin, and then the Lightning Network is built on top of that. But how does it look like? Will a billion people be able to transact in the Lightning Network? Will there be enough liquidity? What are your predictions there? Yeah, I mean, I think that over the coming decade, there's going to be a tremendous advances in non-custodial scaling, meaning like ways for you to actually be in control of your Bitcoin and use it. That will be on-chain improvements, um, as well as second layer improvements, things like the Lightning Network. There's, there's other technologies that will complement, perhaps even outrival the Lightning Network in the future. It, I'm a huge Lightning Network supporter, but it's not destined to be the only thing. I mean, that people are gonna create other ways to, to program Bitcoin to do cool things. Um, I think Lightning Network is going to be huge for a while, but I mean, there could be other stuff, other ways to scale Bitcoin use that, that people look, when we look at 2050, when we look back at Bitcoin's history, I believe that the, and we pick and, and 10 most important people are picked. Like, let's say there's some newspaper doing a 10 most important people from the first 50 years of Bitcoin history. I mean, I feel like at least five of them haven't even gotten into Bitcoin yet. Like, like the kind of stuff that's going to happen is just so exciting when we start getting the rest of the world involved in this project. Um, 
again, just 2% of us, right? Um, so I get the other 98% evolved. It's going to be really exciting. So um, I, I think when it comes to scaling, look, it's going to be a mix of custodial scaling. I, I mean, first and foremost, how do most of us get introduced to Bitcoin? By buying it through a custodian. I mean, so these custodians are going to get huge. They're already massive. I mean, you look at Coinbase or Binance, look at the volumes they do. They, they, this, these are companies that are bigger than JP Morgan Chase and stuff already. Like, God, what are they going to look like in the future? So you're going to have these behemoth custodians that like handle Bitcoin services for companies and municipalities and governments and pension funds and whatever. And a lot of people will just choose to bank their Bitcoin with somebody else, you know? But whether it be in emerging markets or people who like, you know, are pro-freedom or whatever, there's going to be uh, a, a large percentage of Bitcoin users who, who, who are in control. Um, and that's very important because that prevents Bitcoin from following the same fate as gold, which was centralized and removed from the monetary system. You can't do that with Bitcoin if, if, the, if the users control it. It's impossible. So I feel like um, lightning will get better. You're going to see continue to see huge growth there. There's going to be more scaling solutions presented in the next few years uh, for Bitcoin. Custodial growth will rise dramatically. Uh, I don't think there'll be any problems here. Um, I, I, I do think on-chain fees will get very expensive. I mean, what, what you're seeing now with Ethereum is probably uh, something like that will rhyme in the future with Bitcoin. Like you'll, you'll see fees get to the point where like it's, it's not really feasible to make an on-chain payment for like a retail pay service or for someone who doesn't have a lot of capital, they'll, they'll have to either what's known as share a UTXO. So there's this idea of like sharing them through multi-sig and through other kinds of technologies where like individuals can have ownership over part of a Bitcoin, but they're sharing it with others. And this is, a, this is an interesting uh, concept that's being promoted by several people right now. Um, or, or they'll just be on, and, that, and then that can be used in a, in a, in a construct like the Lightning Network. So, um, I, I think there's a bright future for non-custodial Bitcoin use, but I mean, we can't deny that custodial Bitcoin use is just going to be absolutely massive in the next decade. Beautiful. So maybe to, to wrap this up and then also share like some things where people can find you and more about your work um, mm -hmm. and also your great writing about Bitcoin as well. Um, what would be like one piece of advice that you would like to give somebody that is curious about Bitcoin, who joined this now, who has been through like three sessions, who's consuming stuff about it, but maybe is still on, on zero Bitcoin? What kind of yeah. advice would you give them? <laughs> okay, so first of all, invest your time in it. Um, start learning about it. I mean, there's just such a wealth of information. The quality of information available like today is so much better than it was five years ago. And obviously, 10 years ago didn't exist. So, um, I mean, even like the Michael Saylor free online series is like a great place to start probably. I mean, I've looked at it. I, I think it's Stephen, Stefan, you know, Lavera. Um, he curates it. I, it's quite good. Um, was it that, not Breedlove, Robert Breedlove, that, that series, or did, you, did they both? They, they both contributed, but I think Lavera was like in charge of it. I mean, uh, th th that's a really great place to start. Um, you look at, um, I, I like Andreas Antonopoulos's videos from the 2015 to the 2020 era. They're all on YouTube. I mean, he, he covers everything that you could ever, you want to learn about the difficulty algorithm. You want to learn about Bitcoin energy use. You want to learn about, the Lightning Network, you want to learn about anything related to Bitcoin, just type in YouTube, whatever your in difficulty algorithm, Andreas Antonopoulos, and then just sit there and listen to him explain it to you like a freaking pro for like five minutes. And then this just, just helps you, like, it helps you, you know, helps you understand. Um, and he's got several books that try, try to do the same thing, but really his, his talks are like really great. The internet of money is a good place to start. Um, so then, then it's usage, you got to use it. So, I mean, Download a wallet, open source wallet. Um, see if a friend will send you some. Uh, see if you can earn some. Um, buy some. I mean, you know, buying some usually entails, you know, some sort of conversation with yourself about KYC and 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 the state. But most of you are probably already, you know, using traditional banking services anyway. So I mean, you know, maybe you you, you maybe you make a trade off decision where you say, okay, like let me buy twenty bucks via Cash App. I mean, what's, what's amazing is that you can now withdraw out of Cash App via the Lightning Network, like to, to your own Lightning wallet that has nothing to do with your identity. Like this is like the ATM of the future. It's kind of amazing. So um, we're getting to a pretty exciting moment, but I mean, invest your time and then, and then yeah, start using, start using, start using. I mean, it, it takes time. I mean, 
you might just be in a learning process, or maybe you do something called dollar cost averaging, where you buy five bucks of Bitcoin every month, you know, something like that, um, or week or 10 bucks or 20, bucks, whatever your budget is, but you buy a small amount on a regular basis and you, you keep learning. And then maybe six months later, you're like, you know what? I want a hardware wallet. You know what? I want to learn about how to run a full node. You know what? I want to run a lightning node. Like, like these are all hobbyist projects that you do in at basically when you have free time. Um, for some of you, it'll turn into a career. And it's a very, very deep rabbit hole. And anyone who tells you they're an expert on Bitcoin or they know everything, they <laughs> yeah. might be an expert, but they don't know everything. They're I mean, I, I, I learn new things every day. Like seriously, like big things that I hadn't even really thought about before. Uh, like yesterday I was learning about like, just like the security of Bitcoin and stuff like that. And there's just nooks and crannies that, will, I mean, you'd be in this for years and years and years and every day you learn something new. It's, it's, it's very cool. It's very rich. And for everyone here who's a Students for Liberty volunteer, you also have the option to get reimbursed on the Lightning Network. Um, so you can get reimbursed yeah, in Bitcoin and we will roll this out like in a big fashion soon. But if you already request that from, from the staffer that you know, we will make it happen and send you some Bitcoin if you get reimbursed. Yeah, and I'll have, I'll have a book coming out, I think in time for Bitcoin 2022 called um, Check Your Financial Privilege, uh, as well as uh, there's another book by a friend of mine in Alan Farrington coming out, I believe, sooner than that called Bitcoin is Venice. Uh, Bitcoin is Venice is a masterpiece. I mean, it is, if you want to think deeply about um, freeing ourselves from our neo-feudal system, <laughs> you got to check out Bitcoin is Venice. It's, I, I had the honor of writing the forward to it. It's, uh, it's just nice. a masterpiece. So I would check out those two books for sure. Hopefully and then uh, the little Bitcoin book also, which you have written with a bunch of other very prolific thinkers. So I'll give that also um, yes. a go. And there's a lot of resources. Just follow um, Alex Gladstein on Twitter as well. He tweets with a bunch of very important folks. And then you get like a sense who you can trust. Don't just go to YouTube and type in Bitcoin because <laughs> there's so many people that just make a living of like predicting the price and like telling you about all these other coins. And most of that is just bullshit. So yeah. uh, really look at the people that we've been mentioned here and, and go from there so that you know that people trust because a lot of people, and it's like the Wild West out there, they just try to make like uh, a killing out of this and don't give you reliable information. Focus less on the price, focus on your understanding. Yeah, I, I, I mean, you, you, you can follow people like uh, Jameson Lopp and uh, Matt Odell. I mean, they're, they're going to be good because they teach you about um, privacy, security, trade-offs. Uh, they have really good practical advice. Matt Odell runs a phenomenal weekly podcast called The Citadel, where, where they talk about um, tough issues of ranging from privacy to running your full node to all that stuff. You listen to the Citadel once a week. I mean, you're going to start becoming knowledgeable about Bitcoin real quick. Um, there's also a couple other shows I'd recommend. Uh, just if you want like a macro picture of the space, like all the stuff that's happening, because all the stuff that's not in Bitcoin is still relevant to Bitcoin. Like it, it's all relevant, whether it be um, U.S. government law or financing in the crypto universe, or all that stuff is relevant to a degree to Bitcoin and. Nick Carter runs a podcast every Friday called On the Brink. It's, a, it's like a half hour, just recap of the week. It's brilliant. So Rick, that's a nice way to orient yourself. Um, and uh, Stefan Levera obviously has got a great show that may resonate with a lot of you. Um, Peter McCormick has a great show that ha he has a lot of educational series. He's got a whole thing on the Lightning Network that he did. Um, so, you know, we live in a time of, you know, great access to information about this topic. Wonderful. And uh, I would encourage all of you, it depends what you're looking for. If you're looking for to revolutionize money and address all of the, the issues that Alex so eloquently has outlined here today, then look at Bitcoin. Don't get distracted with the 10,000 other projects that are out there, which might, <laughs> might have like an interesting technological angle to it, might yeah. solve like an interesting business problem, which is great. Maybe if you want to go into that, fine. But if you really care about money and freeing the world and like making wars more expensive and making the world more equal and more just, and having financial repression a thing of the past, focus first and foremost on Bitcoin. Um, that's what I would say. Uh, as closing, Alex, thank you so much for everything that you do for the ecosystem and for talking to our audience. We will make sure to push this out on all of our channels. Um, thank you. And well. Please follow him as well, because he's writing also how Bitcoin solves issues in developing countries and in countries that have a lot of human rights issues. For instance, he's written about Palestine um, and about many other countries then please check that out. Also the colonial system that he's mentioned, there's a, there's a lot of interesting facets to it that, that Alex has so eloquently written about. Just Google his name and Bitcoin Magazine or whatever, and you will find a lot of his content. Thank you, Wolf. And thank you, everybody. And we'll talk soon. Take care. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.